What's up? I'm Vin, and today I want to go through the 2021 BC Calculus free response question number four. So let's get started. For part A, we want to find on what open intervals is the graph of G concave up, and we have to give a reason for our answer. So for something like this, the thought process for a question like this, when I hear the phrase G of X is concave up, G is concave up automatically makes me think that G double prime of X is greater than zero. So to answer part A, I have to find g double prime of x, and I'm told here that g of x is this area function. So if I use the fundamental theorem of calculus part two, then I could say g prime of x is equal to f of x. I could also say that g double prime of x is now equal to f prime of x. So what that tells me is I'm also able to look for when is f prime of x greater than zero, and I think about what were we given? We were given a graph of f. So then I have to think about what's the connection between the graph of f and f prime. I could look for when is the slope of f greater than zero. Or in other words, I could look for when f of x is increasing. And notice the graph is increasing from x equals negative 4 to x equals negative 2. And it's also increasing from x equals 2 to x equals 6. So now I have enough information here to write our answer. So we could say here g of x is concave up. And first off, we have to say on which interval. So g of x is concave up on negative 4, negative 2, union 2 to 6. But because they said give a reason for our answer, we have to write a because after this. So this is true because f of x is increasing on those intervals. For part b, we have to use the product rule. We have p of x equals g of x times f of x. And we want to find p prime of 3. So p prime of 3, if we use the product rule, is going to be equal to g prime of 3, f of 3, plus g of 3, f prime of 3. So the easiest things that we could find so far is f of 3 and f prime of 3. But one little side note before we jump into this, remember from before, g prime of x is equal to f of x. So one thing I could write right away is that g prime of 3 is equal to f of 3. So this simplifies a little bit to f of 3 times f of 3 plus g of 3 times f prime of 3. So once again, the easiest one I think to find would be f of 3. And that's simply the y value at x equals 3 for the graph of f. And notice the y value here is negative 3. See here, this is the point 3, negative 3. So right away, this simplifies to negative 3 times negative 3. And then what I have here, Afterwards, I have plus g of 3, I have to use this original area function, is the integral from 0 to 3 of f of t dt. And I'll just put this piece in parentheses. And I'm multiplying that by f prime of 3. And f prime of 3 is the slope of this function at x equals 3. And since at this part it's a straight line, I just have to analyze the slope. And notice I'm going up 1 over 1. So the slope of this line that I'm highlighting in red is equal to 1. So that tells us that f prime of 3 is equal to 1. So I'll just replace that last piece over here. If they, for some reason, wanted us to find the slope at x equals 1, this isn't part of the question, but I could say f prime of 1 equals negative 4, since the slope of that line segment is negative 4. But once again, that's not needed, so we'll just get rid of that. So then now, all of our focus should shift to how do we find the area under the curve from x equals 0 to x equals 3. All right, so once again, a definite integral with actual numbers here is telling you to find the area under the curve. The number on bottom tells you where to start and the number on top tells you where to stop. So we'll just change colors here. We'll, so we're saying we're starting here at zero and we're stopping, we're stopping here at three. But notice from zero to two, from zero to two, I have two triangles that are equal in area, but they're on opposite sides of the x-axis. So just remember area above we treat as positive and area under we treat as negative. So right away, like this piece here in parentheses, I'm going to say is so far zero because this area cancels out so far. The area of these two triangles cancels out. And then the last piece of area we have to find, remember, we have to stop at three. I have to find the area of this shape here that I'm sectioning off. So notice I have one square, two squares, three squares. And then over here, the slope of this line was one. So it cuts the fourth square in half. So I have half of a square. So that means I have three and a half square units left, but notice it's under the x-axis, so I have to treat it as negative 3.5. And so far here, what we have is negative 3 times negative 3 is positive 9. 
So now I have nine plus zero minus 3.5. I could write the times one here, but multiplying by one doesn't do anything exciting. So I have nine minus 3.5. So this whole thing simplifies to 5.5. So for part C, we'll clean this graph up a little bit. And for part C, we have to find that limit using L'Hopital's rule. And one thing we should mention here is that to use L'Hopital's rule, you have to first make sure that your limit is in indeterminate form. So one thing I'm just thinking about checking mentally here is for a question like this, I'm thinking about what is the value of g of 2? Because I know if I plug 2 in on bottom, I'm going to get 0. But I think about g of 2 is the integral from 0 to 2 of f of t dt. And think about what we said before, the area if I go from zero and this time I stop at two, is gonna give me those two triangles again that are equal and opposite in area. So this is just gonna to simplify to zero. So g of two is equal to zero, so I know this is setting us up to use L'Hopital's rule. But if you wanna be very, very careful here, how do we know that we're able to evaluate this limit by just plugging into g of x? Like, how do I know the limit as x approaches two of g of x is equal to g of two, which is equal to zero? I would have to say that g of x is continuous. And how do we know that g of x is continuous? Well, before we said g prime of x equals f of x. And if g prime is equal to f and f is continuous, that means g prime is continuous. So g of x is differentiable and continuous. Okay, say this to yourself a few times if you have to, but if I say g prime is continuous, that has the same meaning as saying g of x is differentiable. So now that I've established that g of x is differentiable and continuous, then I could say that the limit as x approaches 2 of g of x is equal to g of 2, and g of 2 is equal to 0. And now I'm also going to show here that the limit as x approaches 2 of x squared minus 2x, that's also equal to 0. I'd be very careful writing equals 0 over 0, because technically that's not proper notation that's, un that's undefined. So you'd be surprised some of the things they'll subtract points for from the AP test. So I would just say it separately here that the limit of the numerator is equal to zero and the limit of the denominator is equal to zero. And I could say, so L'Hopital's rule, which I'll abbreviate, applies. And now we'll apply L'Hopital's rule. That means the limit as x approaches two of g of x over x squared minus two x is equal to, by L'Hopital's rule, the limit as x approaches 2 of g prime of x over 2x minus 2. And now, once again, because I said g prime is continuous, remember before we said g prime is a continuous function, that means when I want to evaluate this limit, I could just evaluate this limit by plugging into g prime. So this is equal to g prime of 2 over 2 times 2 minus 2. So this is just going to give us a denominator of 2. And g prime of 2 is equal to f of 2. And the function value of 2 is equal to negative 4. See, this is the point 2, negative 4. So that means this is equal to negative 4 over 2. So this whole limit simplifies to negative 2. So for part d, the first thing we want to do is find the average rate of change of g on the interval from negative 4 to 2. So this is just using the formula. We have g of 2 minus g of negative 4 over, and then we have 2 minus negative 4. So before, we already said that g of 2 is equal to 0. Remember, g of 2 is the area from 0 to 2, and these triangles are equal and opposite in area, so they cancel out. So this simplifies to 0 minus g of negative 4, I could say is the integral from 0 to negative 4 of f of t dt, and I'm dividing all of this by 2 minus negative 4, which is 6. But notice here, the negative 4 on top is smaller than 0. So I could flip the limits of integration, and that's going to change this minus sign to a plus. So I could say this is equal to just positive, and I have the integral from negative 4 to 0 of f of t dt divided by 6. And now for this part, I'm finding the area under the curve from negative 4 to 0. So I'm going to cut this into two shapes. Notice I have a triangle here, and it's a right triangle. So the area, I could just go over two units and up six units, and two times six is 12, but if I cut that in half, this shape is gonna have an area of six square units. And now to find the area of this piece, this piece left over is a trapezoid. And remember, when you're on the xy axis, the trapezoids could be a little confusing because the bases are the vertical components. Remember, the bases of a trapezoid are the parallel sides. 
So the formula for the area of a trapezoid is one half height, and the height is two units across the bottom here. And the bases, the first base goes up to six, and the second one goes up to four. So half of two cancels out, and six plus four is 10. So the area from negative four to zero is just six plus 10, or I could just say 16. So this works out to 16 over six, and this reduces to eight thirds. But now the rest of this question, this has a very nice trap set here. Does the mean value theorem guarantee a value C where C is between negative four and two, where G prime is equal to the average rate of change? Just know the only time you could use MVT is when your function is differentiable and continuous. So uh, we'll just abbreviate that here. So when our function is differentiable and continuous. Now, just think about the trap here is that from negative four to two, I'm gonna clear this out now since we used all this, like we don't need that area anymore drawn in. From negative four to two, someone who's not careful might say, oh, wait a minute, the function's not differentiable here because of the sharp turn. It's not differentiable here, but be careful. They're asking us to apply MVT to the function g of x. And we have to think here, this is not a graph of g of x, this is a graph of f. And once again, before we said g prime of x is equal to f of x. So we could use that same argument as before. g prime of x equals f of x, and f of x is a continuous function. Okay, and this is true. g prime of x equals f of x is continuous on this interval here from negative four to six. So that means, so we could say that the function g of x is differentiable and continuous on the interval from negative four to two, which is a subset of that original interval. So once we say all this, once we say g of x is differentiable and continuous on the interval negative four, two, that means we could apply MVT. So we could say by the mean value theorem, which we'll abbreviate, we could say there exists a value C. C is between negative four and two, and we say such that g prime of c is equal to the average rate of change, which we found to be 8 thirds. And I made a little typo here. This is say g prime of c. I wrote a 3 there. So g prime of c is equal to 8 thirds. Okay, well, this is going to conclude this video on the BC Calculus 2021 free response question 4. If this video was helpful, please like and subscribe. It really helps me grow the channel. And if you've got any requests, just leave the topics you want me to cover in the comment section below. And thanks for watching.